Okay, welcome guys. In this topic, we are going to discuss about the tyrosine, how the tyrosine is metabolized and what are the various clinical correlations that are there with the tyrosine metabolism. So to understand that, let's first write down, uh, let's first understand the few properties from the classification part. We know that it is a non-essential amino acid. It is a non-essential amino acid. It is a aromatic amino acid. It is keto plus glucogenic amino acid. So these are the few properties that we have discussed earlier from the classification part. Now when it comes to the tyrosine metabolism, what we need to understand is that the tyrosine is required to produce few special molecules in the body. So what are the special products of tyrosine? What are the special products of tyrosine? Why the tyrosine is required? Special products of tyrosine. Tyrosine is required to produce three special products. The first is the the first is the melanin. The second is the thyroid hormone that is T3, T4. And the third is the catecholamines. We have three special products of tyrosine. Melanin, T3, T4 and the catecholamines. So we are going to discuss that how the melanin is synthesized, what are the, the clinical correlations are there with the melanin, T3, T4 and the, the last will be the catecholamine part. So starting with the first one is the, the melanin synthesis. See from the physiology knowledge you may be knowing that the melanin is a molecule that is required for the, the skin uh, color. Right, every one of us has a different skin color complexion. The reason is the melanin concentration. The more the melanin, the darker the complexion is going to be. So, how this melanin is synthesized? The pathway is very long, that is not important. What is important is one reaction that is the rate limiting part of the melanin synthesis. So, how the melanin is synthesized? The tyrosine is going to convert into melanin, and the rate limiting step for that is tyrosinase. For this tyrosinase, we require copper as a cofactor. The cofactor for this reaction is copper. We require copper for the function of tyrosinase. And this is how the melanin is synthesized. The function of melanin, as I have already told to you, the function is going to be, the function is the complexion of the skin. The more the melanin, the darker the complexion is going to be. The more the melanin, the darker the complexion is going to be. If they ask that where this reaction is going to take place, the reaction is going to take place in the melanocyte. In the melanocyte. These melanocytes are present in the stratum basale of the epidermis. So that is the histology part that where these melanocytes are there, they are the, in the stratum basale of epidermis. That is the lowermost layer of the epidermis. That is the lowermost layer of the epidermis. Now, sometime what may happen is that the tyrosinase is congenitally absent. If there is complete deficiency of tyrosinase, if there is deficiency of tyrosinase, if there is complete deficiency of tyrosinase, that we can easily understand that the melanin is not going to be synthesized. So, if there is deficiency of tyrosinase, what I can say is there is going to be severe depletion of melanin. So, I can say no melanin. And if there is no melanin, there will not be any uh, dark complexion in the skin. So, the person will be completely white, completely white and that is referred as albinism. So, deficiency of tyrosinase, there is no melanin and that is called as albinism. That is called as albinism. So, albinism is basically a disease that is occurring because of the deficiency of the enzyme tyrosinase. Should not be confused with vitiligo. See, vitiligo is altogether different thing. What happens in vitiligo that is more or more towards the autoimmune part and there will be patchy discoloration of the skin. You may have seen uh, some persons who are having white white patches on the acral part of the fingers, maybe around the oral KVT, that is vitiligo and that occurs in the later part of the life, maybe 30, 40 or maybe later. But this uh, albinism is going to occur right from the birth, right, because that's a autosomal recessive disorder, the tyrosinase is not there, the albinism, the melanin will not be produced and the person will have complete fair complexion, right, that is called as the uh, albinism.
This is the first uh, special product of tyrosine. The second special product of tyrosine, as I told you, is the thyroid hormone or the T3 T4. So let's see the T3 T4 synthesis. How the T3 T4 are made? T3 T4 synthesis. To understand the T3 T4 synthesis, what we can say is if I say that, say for example, this is the thyroid gland. To understand this thyroid synthesis, very important to understand to understand the basic histology part. So this is the thyroid gland that is situated in the neck. Now in this thyroid gland, there are millions, millions of follicles, follicles, thyroid follicles are there. So how the thyroid follicles look like? In the center of the thyroid follicle, there is some proteinaceous substance. I am making with the yellow color. This proteinaceous substance which is there in the center, this is referred as colloid. Colloid. Now, on around the colloid, we have something called as the follicular cells. Around the colloid, we have something called as the follicular cells. I am making with the red color. So, these are the follicular cells. And around the follicular cells, we have the, the blood capillaries which are running around the, the follicles. So, this purple color which I made is the, the blood capillaries. These are the, the blood capillaries. So, such millions of thyroid molecules, uh, thyroid follicles are there in over thyroid gland, right? And they are continuously producing the T3 and T4, T3 and T4. Now, once we have this orientation, I want to make this diagram in a, uh, in a little uh, other manner. So, if I make that in another way, but once you have the orientation, then it is going to be very easy for you to understand. See, this is the representation of the capillary. From the diagram that I have made above, you can easily appreciate the thing that you are going to be seeing in the attachment of the capillary is the follicular cells. So, this is the follicular cell. And inside to the follicular seal is the yellow proteinaceous substance and that is the colloid. Right. So, this is the same diagram that is there in the thyroid follicle. I have made in, the, in a little different way so that you can understand it better that the outermost in the thyroid follicle is the capillary, then the follicular seal and then the colloid. So, what happens is that whatever iodine that we take in our diet, Whatever iodine that we take in our diet, these iodine, uh, iodine molecules will reach in the, the follicular cell. Will reach in the follicular cell. And then these iodine molecules, the organification of these iodine molecules are going to occur. There will be organification of the iodine molecule is going to occur. And for that, we have the enzyme that is called as iodine peroxidase. The enzyme that is there is iodine peroxidase that is going to convert the iodine into uh, the organified iodine molecule. These follicular cells are also producing one protein. They are also producing one protein and that protein is called as thyroglobulin. That is called as thyroglobin. There is a protein which is produced by the there is a protein which is produced by the thyroid follicular cell that is called as thyroglobin. So, in this thyroglobin, this is a protein, as a protein means a sequence of amino acid. So, there will be a lot of amino acid are going to be there. Lot of amino acid are going to be there. And among these lot of amino acid, there are few tyrosine amino acid are there. There are few tyrosine amino acid are there in that thyroglobin. The tyrosine amino acid are also there. So, what happens is this iodine, the organified iodine molecule will reach inside the colloid as well as these thyroglobin molecules will also reach inside the, the colloid. We know that the thyroglobin contains the tyrosine residues. So, these iodine molecules now going to attach on the tyrosine. If only one iodine molecule are going to attach, if only one molecule of iodine is going to attach on the tyrosine, this entire unit is referred as monoiodotyrosine, MIT. Monoiodotyrosine means one iodine is attached on the tyrosine. If two iodine molecules are attached, then it is referred as diiodotyrosines. So many monoido and diiodo means MIT and DIT, multiple molecules of MIT and DIT will be formed. And these molecules will be coming to the follicular cells. 
the MIT and the DIT will be coming to the follicular seals. The number will be not single, they will be multiple MIT and DITs will be coming. Multiple MIT and DIT. Now, what they are going to do in the follicular seal is that the MIT, if joined with the DIT, mono with di, they will make a molecule that is with the name of T3. And if di clubs with the di, di plus di, then it is called as T4. So, mono plus di is T3 and di plus di is T4. And these molecules now will come in the circulation. T3 and T4, they will come in the circulation. In this entire process, what happens is when the iodine goes inside from the follicular cells to the colloid, we require a receptor here. With the green color I am highlighting, we require a receptor for the transport of the iodine and that is called as the pendrine transporter. That is called as pendrine transporter. With the help of pendrine transporter, the iodine goes inside, right? And ultimately the T3, T4 will be made and they will come in the circulation. So, once they will come in the circulation, they will start rotating in the circulation. They will go to the peripheral tissue. In the peripheral tissue, what happens is, in in peripheral tissue, what happens is that the, the T4 that we have made is going to convert into more active form that is T3. T3 is more active compared to T4. And for that, you need to remove one iodine that is removed via 5 iodinase. Oh, sorry, 5 that is that is going to be removed via 5 D iodinase. With the help of enzyme 5 D iodinase, one iodine will be removed from the T4 so that it will convert into T3. And that is more active. T3 is more active form than the T3. So, this is how the normal iodine is going to be utilized and going to be uh, used for the thyroid hormone synthesis. Now, what are the clinical correlations? What are the clinical correlations? The first is something called as the Pendrate syndrome. Pendrate syndrome. What is Pendrate syndrome? Pendrate syndrome is basically if there is defect in the pendrine transporter. Defect in Pendrine transporter. If the pendrine transporter is defective, now we can easily appreciate that the iodine transport will not occur. I have made with the green color, you can see in this diagram, these are the pendrine transporter. If they are defective, the iodine transport will not occur. And if the iodine transport will not occur, ultimately, if the pendrine transporters are defective, it will lead to something called as the pendrate syndrome. And how it is going to manifest is the patient will have hypothyroidism. Hypothyroidism means there will be decrease in the thyroid hormone. Along with that, these pendrate syndrome, uh, this uh, pendrine transporters are there in the inner ear also, in the ear also. So, the patient will have sensory neural hearing loss, SNHL, sensory neural hearing loss. The patient will have, because hearing loss is of two types, conductive and sensory neural, the, these patients will have sensory neural type of hearing loss. So, this is the first clinical correlation. The second is the pharmacological correlation. Let's say there is a patient of hyperthyroidism, means there is excess amount of T3 and T4 are there. How to treat that? How to treat that? There is a patient who is having the symptoms of hyperthyroidism, say for example, the symptoms are the palpitation, the profuse sweating, the tremors, the exophthalmos, proptosis are there, there is a weight loss history is there. These are the symptoms of hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroidism means there is increase in the metabolism, right? So, we want to decrease the thyroid hormone synthesis and how to do that? We, I have, I have written two enzymes which are involved in the thyroid hormone synthesis. You can see that one enzyme that I have written here is the iodine peroxidase and the second that I have written is the 5-iodinase, 5-d-iodinase. So, if we are able to block them, if we are able to block them, the, iod uh, the thyroid hormone will not be made. So, I can say for the treatment of hyperthyroidism, for the treatment of For the treatment of hyperthyroidism, we are going to use two group of drugs. One, I can say 5-D iodinase inhibitor. And the examples are the propanolol or I can say amiodarone. Amiodarone is basically an anti-arrhythmic drug class 3, but it has also a property that it is uh, an anti-thyroid uh, drug. Along with that, the uh, thioamides that is for example the carbimazole, the methimazole, 
carbimazole, methimazole, they are also inhibitor of iodine iodinase. Whereas the when it comes to the iodine peroxidase inhibitor, they are the thioamide groups drugs that is the carbimazole, methimazole, propyl thiouracil. These are the iodine peroxidase inhibitor. So these are the drugs. One more I can add is the propyl thiouracil. The reason of adding propyl thiouracil is because if a pregnant lady comes to you and she is having symptom of hyperthyroidism, then we need to give propyl thiouracil because carbimazole and the other anti-hyperthyroid drugs are not safe in pregnancy. The only drug that is safe in pregnancy for hyperthyroidism is propyl thiouracil. Is propyl thiouracil. So propyl thiouracil is for pregnancy, safe in pregnancy. Safe in pregnancy. A lady comes to you having pregnancy along with the symptom of hyperthyroidism. We will give propyl thiouracil that is referred as PTU. PTU. This is the this is how the thyroid hormone is synthesized, and these are the clinical correlating parts. Now coming to the third one. The third function or the third special product of the uh, thy tyrosine is the catecholamine synthesis. Catecholamine. synthesis so what are the catecholamines that we have the examples of catecholamine that we have is for example is dopamine norepinephrine or epinephrine these are the catecholamine that we have norepinephrine is same noradrenaline epinephrine is adrenaline so how this catecholamine is synthesized first of all the tyrosine converts into dopa and for that the name of the enzyme is tyrosine hydroxylase the name of the enzyme is tyrosine hydroxylase this tyrosine hydroxylase is the rate limiting step of catecholamine synthesis the rate limiting enzyme for catecholamine synthesis is tyrosine hydroxylase then this dopa will undergo decarboxylation reaction and will convert into dopamine. You remove the carbon dioxide and it will convert into dopamine. So the name of the enzyme is going to be dopa decarboxylase. It's going to be dopa decarboxylase. And we know that whenever we want to do decarboxylation in the amino acid, we require vitamin B6. So I can say that along for this, you are going to require vitamin B6. That is the PLP, pyridoxal phosphate. Then this dopamine can convert into the next catecholamine that is norepinephrine. Norepinephrine. To convert the dopamine into norepinephrine, what we need to do is we uh, need to require, we will be requiring vitamin C. The name of the enzyme is dopamine beta hydroxylase. Dopamine beta hydroxylase. And for this reaction, vitamin C is required. Vitamin C is required. Then this norepinephrine can convert into the, the last type of catecholamine that is epinephrine. And for that what we need to do is we need to add the methyl group. We need to add the methyl group so that the norepinephrine will convert into epinephrine. So I can say what is epinephrine? It is a methylated form of norepinephrine. It is a methylated form of norepinephrine. And from where this methyl group will come? Whenever we will require methyl group we will call the donor of the methyl group that is SAM. SAM stands for S adenosyl methionine. SAM stands for S adenosyl methionine. The property of SAM is that it can easily donate the methyl group. So whenever we require methyl group, we'll call the same that will that is going to donate the methyl group, and we will be able to convert the uh, the norepinephrine into epinephrine. So these are the three catecholamines and the dopamine these are the three catecholamines that we have the dopamine norepinephrine and epinephrine and this is how they are synthesized the rate limiting enzyme is tyrosine hydroxylase what are the clinical correlations the clinical correlation is that if there is excess amount of this dopamine if in excess then what is going to happen is then it will be catabolized and it is going to be catabolized by two enzyme that is something called as compt and mau b 
कॉम्प्ट स्टैंड फॉर कैटेकॉल ओ मिथाइल ट्रांसफ्रेस कैटेकॉल ओ मिथाइल ट्रांसफ्रेस एंड एमओ मोनो अमीन ऑक्सीडेज बी माओ बी स्टैंड फॉर मोनो अमीन ऑक्सीडेज बी कैटेकॉल ओ मिथाइल ट्रांसफ्रेस एंड द मोनो अमीन ऑक्सीडेज बी विद द हेल्प ऑफ दैट अल्टीमेटली इट विल कन्वर्ट इन टू समथिंग कॉल्ड एज होमोवेनिलिक एसिड होमोवेनिलिक एसिड वेर एज द इफ देर इज एक्सेस If the norepinephrine in excess, it will convert into normetanephrine. Normetanephrine, and if the epinephrine in excess, it will convert into metanephrine. It will convert into metanephrine. So, if dopamine is excess, it will convert into homovanilic acid. If norepinephrine or the epinephrine is excess, they will convert into normetanephrine or metanephrine. This norepinephrine and the metanephrine they can directly come in the urine. These molecules can directly come in the urine, or sometimes they may convert into a next metabolite that is called as vanillyl mandelic acid. Vanillyl mandelic acid, and this vanillyl mandelic acid will come in the urine. So if there is excess amount of the norepinephrine, epinephrine, what can come in the urine is norepinephrine. metanephrine or the vma that is vanillyl mandelic acid vanillyl mandelic acid so this is the the complete pathway of the catecholamine synthesis that how they are synthesized and in case if they are in excess how they are going to be thrown out of the body right so dopamine is going to be excreted in the form of homovanillic acid and the norepinephrine epinephrine is going to ultimately may be converting into the vanillyl mandelic acid so what is the clinical uh, correlation the clinical first clinical correlation is with the disease that is with the name of pheochromocytoma pheo chromocytoma what is basically pheochromocytoma is pheochromocytoma is a tumor of the adrenal medulla pheochromocytoma is a tumor of adrenal medulla in the adrenal medulla we have something called as the chromaffin cells we have the chromaffin cells and these chromaffin cells what they are basically doing is they are synthesizing the norepinephrine and the epinephrine so the norepinephrine and the epinephrine they are synthesized in the adrenal medulla by the chromaffin cells now here what we are saying is there is a tumor of these cells if there is tumor then what is going to happen is there is excess number of these cells so there is going to be increase amount of the synthesis of the epinephrine and the norepinephrine and because they are the mediator of the sympathetic system so there is going to be increase in the sympathetic drive the sympathetic system will overshoot the sympathetic system is going to overshoot there is going to be increase in the sympathetic system drive and how it is going to manifest the clinical features are very important for pheochromocytoma if there is increased amount of sympathetic discharge what we are going to notice is the patient will have the patient will have palpitation patient will have palpitation there will be profuse sweating profuse sweating along with that there will be headache with hypertension headache with hypertension whenever there will be sudden surge of epinephrine or epinephrine will occur the patient will have all these symptoms because the half life of the norepinephrine epinephrine is within uh, 5 to 10 minutes the the half life is so less so the symptoms will go off very fast the symptoms will go off very fast so the patient will say that he is having all these symptoms episodically he is having all these symptoms episodically so the word episodic is very important and critical in the diagnosis of pheochromocytoma let's say you are sitting in an opd a young 32 year old male guy coming with these complaints he is saying doc sometimes in between a day i may get these symptoms of uh, episodic uh, palpitation is there palpitation means as if the heart is racing inside the chest uh, there is profuse sweating i feel at that time and there is headache also occurs and when you will check the blood pressure maybe in your opd it might be normal at that particular moment so how to investigate this patient further to confirm the diagnosis of this see we know that what is happening in this there is excess amount of the norepinephrine and epinephrine is there if there is excess amount of norepinephrine and epinephrine we have written that what is going to come in the urine if there is excess amount of norepinephrine epinephrine then the 
the norepinephrine, the metanephrine or the VMA is going to come in the unit, right? So you will check the levels of these three. Now, if they ask that which is the, the most sensitive and which is the most commonly used, then the answer is metanephrine, right? So because that is very sensitive. So what is the investigation that you will do is level of metanephrine, metanephrine and if not given in the option, then you can go for the VMA that is vanillyl mandelic acid levels. VM. You will do the level of the metanephrine and VM. We need to also do the, the MRI scan of the adrenals or the abdomen also because the pheochromocytoma can occur in the extra renal part in the sympathetic ganglia also. So we need to do the MRI also but for now in biochemistry concern we can say we need to do the level of the metanephrine and VM. How to treat this patient? When it comes to the treatment we need to give the irreversible inhibitors of the sympathetic system. Right, and these are the phenoxybenzamines. Phenoxybenzamine is the drug of choice for this condition, and we need to give the phenoxybenzamine that is the drug of choice. That is the drug of choice. So, this is the first clinical correlation of the uh, adrenal, uh, we can say the catecholamine synthesis pathway that is the pheochromocytoma, there is excess amount of that, uh, the norepinephrine and the epinephrine. Now let's see the second clinical correlation. The second clinical correlation is basically with the pharmacology, right? There is a disease with the name of Parkinson. Parkinson. Now what is Parkinson is basically, if you see the pathology part of the Parkinson, what you are going to notice that there is basically there is decrease in the dopamine level in the substantia nigra. There is decrease in the dopamine at substantia nigra. Substantia nigra is a part of the midbrain. In the top of the midbrain, we have this substantia nigra. And if there is decrease in the dopamine, particularly occurs in the substantia nigra, the patient will manifest with certain set of features. How we can remember is with the pneumonic trap. Trap is the pneumonic that you can use for Parkinsonism. T stands for the patient will have the tremors. The tremors that the patient is going to have is the resting type of tremor. So the patient will have the resting tremor means when he is sitting still, let's say his uh, hand is resting on the thigh, at the time the tremor will be there. That is resting tremor. But whenever he is doing the movement, the tremor will not be there. That is resting tremor. R stands for there will be rigidity. That means there is increase in the tone of the muscle. Rigidity means the tone of muscle is increased. A stands for akinesia or bradykinesia that is decrease in the body movement. Akinesia or bradykinesia. P stands for postural instability. Means there is increase in the tendency of fall. So these are the classical uh, features that you may notice in a patient of Parkinson that we will may be remembering with the mnemonic of the trap. So what is the importance of knowing all uh, and what is the correlation of discussing all these things here? See. When it comes to the treatment part, because it's a more or less a clinical diagnosis that is to be made. When it comes to the, the treatment part, when it comes to the, the treatment part, the common modality of the treatment that we do is the combination of two drugs. One is the L-dopa along with the carbidopa. Along with the carbidopa. These two drugs are always given in the combination. Is always given in the combination. See how these two drugs are going to work. These are the oral drugs. So when the patient will take these two, up two tablets, uh, mostly in the market they are uh, there in a single tablet. Both the molecules are integrated in a single tablet. So these two molecules will go inside in the GI tract. They will be absorbed. They will reach in the liver. So what happens is when these uh, molecules will reach in the liver, let's say this is the diagrammatic representation of the liver. This is the, the levodopa. Levodopa is basically the L isomer of the dopa, L isomer of the dopa. If you see the pathway that dopa can convert into dopamine, if you see the pathway that we have discussed just above, dopa can convert into dopamine, dopamine can convert into norepinephrine, can convert into epinephrine, right, and ultimately will be catabolized. This is the normal pathway that occurs. So right now what is happening is the dopa that you are giving, the L dopa, is converting into dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine and all occurring where? Liver. And where is the problem? The problem is in the brain. Let's see, this is the diagrammatic representation of the brain and here is the substantia nigra and there is decrease in the dopamine here. 
we want to increase the dopamine in this particular point at the substantia nigra that is in the midbrain the topmost part i want to increase the dopamine here so how to do that so what we do is when the dopa converts into dopamine we know that the enzyme here is is dopa decarboxylase dopa decarboxylase so what we do is along with the uh, l dopa levodopa we give one more drug that is with the name of carbidopa carbidopa what this carbidopa will do is carbidopa is an inhibitor of this reaction so dopa decarboxylase will not work in the liver so there will be increased amount of levodopa is going to occur this levodopa is easily permeable is easily permeable to the blood brain barrier here is the blood brain barrier so this levodopa is easy perme easily permeable to the blood brain barrier and will reach here once the levodopa can reach here it can reach here this levodopa can easily converts into dopamine and the dopamine will increase in the substantia nigra the good thing is that the carbidopa is not permeable to the blood brain barrier so it cannot go inside and it cannot inhibit the reaction in the brain and this is what we want so the point is that why we give always the combination of l dopa and carbidopa because if you just give the l dopa it is not going to solve the purpose the levodopa is completely going to be catabolized in the liver itself it will not reach in the brain right and this is what we do not want so we give additional drug that is carbidopa and that is a peripheral inhibitor of the dopa decarboxylase and that we can write in the pathway as well so i am just scrolling up the notes and here is the pathway the dopa decarboxylase you can see here i am writing this additional thing here that it can be inhibited by the drug that is carbidopa that is carbidopa so this is one clinical correlation that we have right in the treatment of uh, parkinson now i told you that to catabolize this dopamine to catabolize this dopamine just uh, focus on the pathway the catabolize the dopamine we require two enzymes that is compt and maob right if i inhibit these two enzymes what is going to happen is that the dopamine is not going to be catabolized and it will remain for a longer duration in the brain and this is what we want in the parkinson that we do not want to dopamine to be catabolized and which enzyme is involved in that the compt and the maob so you can give the drugs that inhibit these enzymes also in the treatment of parkinson so one modality of the treatment is levodopa plus carbidopa and this is how they works the the other drugs that you can give is the compt inhibitor that is entacapone tolcapone that can be used then we can use the maob inhibitor monoamine oxidase b inhibitor that is selegeline rasageline that is the maob inhibitor tolcapone is not used now tolcapone is hepatotoxic so it is withdrawn from the market is hepatotoxic so it is not used now it is withdrawn from the market tolcapone this is how the parkinson management is done right so the, this was the uh, we can say the last or the third special product of the tyrosine so there are three special product the first one that we have discussed was melanin the disorder that we have discussed was albinism the second we have discussed about the thyroid hormones the t3 t4 how to manage the hyperthyroidism the pendet syndrome we have discussed then the third thing that we have discussed about the catecholamines in that we have discussed the pheochromocytoma we have discussed the parkinsons so these are the three special products now there is a special situation see for example what happening in the uh, what what happens commonly is i told you that tyrosine is required for the three special products tyrosine is required for three special products the melanin the t3 t4 and the catecholamines let's say all the three are there in the normal quantity all the three are there in the normal quantity normal concentration normal level everything are available but we are eating tyrosine from outside continuously we are having all the three and we are eating tyrosine from outside continuously then what is going to happen then this tyrosine excess tyrosine whatever excess tyrosine is have is there it will undergo catabolism 
if there is excess amount of tyrosine then it is under it is under it will undergo catabolism right right so now we are going to discuss a pathway that is called as tyrosine catabolism pathway tyrosine catabolism pathway let's understand what is tyrosine catabolism pathway is i told you that if all the three are there in normal amount the tyrosine is supposed to be catabolized right how to do that so to catabolize the tyrosine tyrosine let's see the first the various intermediate of the tyrosine catabolism pathway various intermediate first tyrosine converts into something called as 4 hydroxy phenyl pyruvate that is written as 4 hpp 4 hpp then it is going to convert into then it is going to convert into something called as homogentisite or homogenetic acid homogenetic acid hga then it will convert into something called as melyl acetoacetate written as maa then it will convert into fumaryl acetoacetate written as faa and ultimately it will convert into something called as fumarate and acetoacetate fumarate and acetoacetate so this is how the tyrosine is catabolized this is how the tyrosine is catabolized so how uh, we can remember is i can share a mnemonic with you that is in hindi if you can remember it directly very good if not you can use the mnemonic but the problem is that is in hindi so i'm just sharing the mnemonic with you uh, how the tyrosine is catabolized see whenever we do a alcohol party whenever we do a alcohol party what we need to do is first we drink then what we happens is we go high and high then we start singing then who mostly comes to stop us the first is the mother if not if the mother fails then the father comes and ultimately the party stops if you are drinking at home so what i can say is the mnemonic is in this way that hum pehle peete hain hpp hum pehle peete hain then what we do is hum gaate hain then who comes the mother then who comes the father and ultimately the party will finish and everyone will go to their home everyone will be split it right so these are the events that can happen if you are uh, having a alcohol party at your home if you can remember it directly is very good if not you can use this mnemonic so what are once we are clear with the intermediate let's see the names of the enzymes that are there involved in this pathway the tyrosine converts into the 4 hpp the name of the enzyme is tyrosine transaminase tyrosine transaminase then the 4 hpp deoxygenase then hga oxidase then is the maa isomerase then is the faa hydrolase this is how the tyrosine is catabolized It means whatever excess tyrosine we are having we are going to tire cut the tyrosine by using these various enzymes but if there is deficiency of any of these enzymes what we can easily appreciate is the tyrosine is not going to be catabolized and is going to accumulate in the body if there is deficiency of any of the enzyme any of the enzyme say for example let's say there is deficiency of this enzyme tyrosine transaminase then the tyrosine is not going to be catabolized it will accumulate in the body and that condition is referred as tyrosinemia tyrosinemia means there is increase amount of tyrosine in the body whether it is the first enzyme that is deficit or whether the last enzyme the ff hydrolase if there is deficiency ultimately the fumaryl the melyl homogentisate ultimately the tyrosine is going to accumulate and that will be also referred as tyrosinemia so to make it simple what they have given what they have did is they have given the numbers if there is deficiency of ff hydrolase leading to tyrosinemia that is called as tyrosinemia type 1 If there is deficiency of tyrosine transaminase, this is called as tyrosinemia type two. If there is deficiency of this HPP deoxygenase leading to tyrosinemia, that is called as tyrosinemia type three. 
So these are the mainly three types of tyrosinemias that we should know. One, two, and three. And in the exam, we should be able to find out that which tyrosinemia is due to deficiency of which enzyme. This is what they commonly ask, right? And why these tyrosinemias are important. So let's write down the first point that why the why we are so much concerned about tyrosinemia. Tyrosinemia increases the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. So tyrosinemia is a risk factor. is a risk factor for hepatocellular carcinoma hcc hepatocellular carcinoma hepatocellular carcinoma the marker of the hepatocellular carcinoma is the alpha fetoprotein the marker is alpha fetoprotein When when it comes to the exam, see in the exam, if it is a multiple choice question and you have to find out that which tyrosinemia is due to deficiency of which enzyme, I can put that thing in that way. Uh, see tyrosinemias, we we are saying that the tyrosinemias we have of three types: one, two, and three. One is due to deficiency of FAA hydrolase. The type 2 is due to deficiency of tyrosine transaminase and type 3 is due to the deficiency of 4 hydroxy phenyl pyruvate 4 hydroxy phenyl pyruvate deoxygenase. These are the enzymes that are involved in the tyrosinemias. So how to find out in a multiple choice question? See if they ask type 1, we can say type 1. Instead of 1, we can say type 1st. F, F. Type 1st starts with the letter F. When it is type 2, it is tyrosine transaminase. So I can say it is T2. So F, it is easy to recognize type 1 first. T2 is type 2. When it comes to type 3, 1, 2 and 3, 3 is the highest number, highest number, highest the number, longest the enzyme. So you need to find the longest option in the exam. So this is how we can remember the various tyrosinemias, type 1, type 2 and type 3. Tyrosinemia type 1, there is a very peculiar clinical feature for tyrosinemia type 1. Type 1, uh, we can write here itself, one of the very peculiar clinical, clinical feature that is there is that there is the body secretions will have smell like the boiled cabbage or the rancid butter means the rotten butter. So the clinical feature is boiled cabbage like smell. Boiled cabbage like smell. The patient body secretions will have the boiled cabbage like smell such as urine stool or rancid butter like smell. Rancid butter like smell of the body section that is a feature of type 1 only that is a feature of type 1 only so this is all about the tyrosinemias that we should know that basically it is a risk factor for hepatocellular carcinoma and how we are going to find out that in the exam if they ask type 1 is due to deficiency of what 2 and 3 deficiency of which enzyme there is one more very important condition that is more important than the tyrosinemias see if there is deficiency of this enzyme HGA oxidase, if there is deficiency of HGA oxidase, it will lead to a special condition that is referred as l captone urea. That is referred as l captone urea. So, HGA oxidase deficiency leads to l captone urea. We need to see the details of l captone urea, how the patient of l captone urea is going to present to us, and how we are going to treat that patient. So, let's write down the heading of l captone urea. l captone urea. To understand the L-captone urea, basically what I am doing is I am writing that reaction, that particular reaction that is involved in the L-captone urea again. So that reaction is normally what happens is the homogeneity homogenetic acid or the homogeneity normally converts into melyl acetoacetate, and for that the enzyme is HGA oxidase. This is the, the normal reaction that is occurring in all of us. Now here what is happening in this particular patient of l urea is that this enzyme is absent. 
so this reaction is not taking place not taking place so there will be increased amount of homogeneity acid that we are going to notice this homogeneity acid sometime what happens is that it triggers alternate pathway triggers alternate pathway and it converts into a molecule that is called as benzoquinone acetate benzoquinone acetate bzq this benzoquinone acetate is the culprit for all the symptoms that are there in the alkaptone urea patient see what this benzoquinone acetate can do is this benzoquinone acetate can come in urine if this molecule comes in the urine it will lead to darkening of urine darkening of urine on standing now what is the meaning of darkening of urine on standing means what that if you take a urine sample of a patient of alkaptonuria the normal color of the urine is the pale yellow yes the straw color now in this patient of alkaptonuria what is going to happen is that you take the urine sample you wait for 15 to 20 minutes the urine color will change automatically to dark brown blackish color and there are some reagents also available you can put the reagent so this reaction will occur fast and the urine changes color on standing right that is one one thing that is happening in the patient of alkaptonuria and mostly it is not going to be problematic part the reason is we whenever we urinate we do not wait in the toilet just 15 20 minutes just to see whether the urine color is changing or not so most of the time the patient of alkaptonuria they are completely unaware about this finding that is there in the, in these patients so you have that is a, a leading question that you have to ask and then they will check that and they will say okay yes we are having this problem also right so this is most of the part most of the time it is going to be the hidden part of this particular disease that they are completely unaware about that the urine changes the color on standing in these patient so how these patient will come to you then see what happens is this benzoquinone acetate there is one more thing that they will do this benzoquinone acetate will convert into the crystals of the benzoquinone acetate these crystals are called as referred as the alkaptone bodies they are called as alkaptone bodies these alkaptone bodies are going to deposit in the cartilage they are going to deposit deposit in cartilage and once these crystals are going to deposit in the cartilage they will lead to rapid destruction of the cartilage they will lead to rapid destruction of the cartilage if there is rapid rapid destruction of cartilage occurs due to alkaptone bodies this process this process is referred as ochronosis this process is referred as ochronosis so basically in alkaptone urea patient there are two findings that you have to see one is ochronosis and second is the darkening of urine on standing these are the two findings that are going to be there in the question or in a clinical vignette that they are going to see you are going to find let's see the uh, the presentation part how the patient is going to present when it comes to the clinical feature we have understood the pathophysio part now we are going to see the clinical feature see most of the time these patient will not come to you in the first 30 third uh, to fourth decade of life right so mostly the manifestation will occur in the third fourth decade of life i can put the things in that way is if you uh, if you see that uh, a very common condition that you may have seen in your family maybe in relative that what happens is normally let's say this is the femur bone and here is the tibia bone means this is a representation of the knee joint and this is the meniscus or the cartilage which is there now what happens is when we were born these cartilages were completely new completely fine but with due course of time what happens is there is a continuous trauma that occurs and within the 7th 8th decade of life means when we will be in the 70s 80s these cartilages will be destroyed they will be destroyed so much that sometimes what happens is that the femur bone might come in the contact of the tibia bone directly and because of the friction movement that is going to occur between these two bones this condition is referred as osteoarthritis and that is very common that is very common that most of us are going to suffer whatever degree may be mild moderate severe but we are going to suffer to osteoarthritis that is normal thing that occurs in the 70s 80s but if you see the same process that is occurring in the alkaptone urea patient let's say this is the femur bone the tibia bone when the patient is born everything is completely fine the cartilage is fresh and new but 
बिकॉज द बेंजोकिनोन एसिटेड क्रिस्टल्स आर देयर बी जेड क्यू द बेंजोकिनोन एसिटेड क्रिस्टल्स आर देयर सो दे विल स्टार्ट डिपोजिटिंग सिंस बर्थ एंड बिकॉज ऑफ द डिपोजिशन ऑफ दैट देर विल बी रेपिड डिस्ट्रक्शन ऑफ कार्टिलेज सो विद इन आई कैन से थर्ड टू फोर्थ डिकेट मीन्स विद इन थर्टी फोर्टीज द कार्टिलेज विल बी सो मच डिस्ट्रॉयड दैट द द फीमर बोन विल कम इन द कॉन्टेक्ट ऑफ द टीबिया बोन राइट सो अगेन वी विल हैव द पिक्चर विच इज वेरी सिमिलर टू ऑस्ट्रो आर्थ राइट इज द ओनली डिफरेंस इज द एज ग्रुप राइट सो यू आर सिटिंग इन ओ पी डी अ पेशेंट कम्स टू यू ही इज अट से थर्टी फोर ईयर ओल्ड सॉफ्टवेयर इंजीनियर एंड राइट नाउ ही इज हैविंग कंप्लेन दैट डॉक्टर आई एम हैविंग सीवियर पेन इन माई नी जॉइन अनेबल आई एम अनेबल टू गेट अप फ्रॉम माई चेयर आई एम अनेबल टू रन इन माई ऑफिस अनेबल टू टेक द अपस्टे द स्टेयर केसेज सो वॉट यू विल डू इज वेन एवर दिस पेशेंट ऑफ जॉइंट पेन यू विल ऑर्डर एक्स रे एंड वेन यू ऑर्डर एक्स रे यू विल सी दैट देर इज अ पिक्चर विच इज वेरी सिमिलर टू ऑस्ट्रो आर्थराइटिस द कार्टिलेज इज डिस्ट्रॉइड नॉट जस्ट इन द नी जॉइंट मे बी इन द स्पाइन मे बी द अदर कार्टिलेज इवन द नोज कार्टिलेज द इयर पिन द कार्टिलेज दे मे ऑल्सो बी डिस्ट्रॉयड राइट सो Uh, this is how the most of the time the patient is going to present to you. So when it comes to the presentation, I can say that the the presenting age group is the third to fourth decade of life. This is the this is the time when the clinic uh, the alkaptone urea patient will come to you. Third to fourth decade of life. The only manifestation in childhood is only manifestation. in childhood is darkening of urine and which might be unnoticed which might be unnoticed because it's not a problematic part that is the only problem that may be there in the childhood right so uh, again it's more or less a clinical diagnosis the patient will come early age group osteoarthritis feature you will go for x uh, you will do the x ray looking like osteoarthritis you will do the enzyme as say the enzyme assays are going to be decreased right the investigation that you are going to do is homogeneity said oxidase level that is going to be decreased now once you have made the diagnosis once you have made the diagnosis it is the time to treat the patient the drug that we give uh, is a recently approved drug that is with the name of nitisinol nitisinol what the nitisinol is basically it is a partial inhibitor partial inhibitor of 4 HPP deoxygenase. 4 HPP deoxygenase is a partial inhibitor of 4 HPP deoxygenase. Means what? See uh, how this nitisinone works. Basically, how this nitisinone works. See what is the idea is in alkaptone urea is to delay the arthritis somehow to maybe 60s or 70s, right? If the arthritis occurs in 60s, 70s, that is more or less normal. so we are trying to delay the arthritis it is going to happen but we are trying to delay so that when the patient is in the young age group the arthritis does not occur how to how to avoid the arthritis see uh, how this nitisinol works is basically we have written that the tyrosine if i write the tyrosine catabolism pathway we have written like tyrosine converts into 4 hpp then it converts into the hga then it converts into maa and ultimately ultimately will convert into fumarate and acetoacetate this is what we have written now here in the patient of uh, alkaptone urea what is happening is this reaction is not occurring this reaction is not occurring this is the alkaptone urea so because this reaction is not occurring this hg is accumulating it is converting into benzoquinone acetate and that is leading to early arthritis early arthritis this is the problematic part so what we do is we know that 4 hpp converts into hga for that the enzyme is 4 hpp deoxygenase we give a drug that will partially inhibit this enzyme that is with the name of nitisinol so if you inhibit this enzyme partially we can easily observe that there is going to be decrease in hga homogeneity acid is going to be decrease if there is less homogeneity acid there will be less benzoquinone acetate and the arthritis will be delayed and this is what we want so this is how we treat the patient of alkaptone urea by inhibiting the previous reaction partially so that the less amount of homogeneity acid the less amount of bzq and ultimately there will be the arthritis is going to be delayed right so this is how the this is how the we can say that the alkaptone urea patient is managed right okay thank you guys